children's story that I'm pretty sure all of us are familiar with, especially if you grew up in the States. Uh, so I heard this story over and over when, you're, when I was very young. And um, there's like all these various, uh, there's a whole bunch of variations to it. Right? So uh, you probably know the story. It's called The Three Little Pigs, right? Who here knows the story? Everyone knows the story? All right, so there's like six of you, so maybe no one really knows the story. So why don't I go ahead and try to you know, get everybody a prize of this story. So the story goes, there's like a whole bunch of variations, but essentially there's three pigs that go off to the world. And these pigs are not normal pigs because they're apparently really good at building stuff, right? So the first pig, for whatever reason, builds his house out of straw. And the second pig builds his house out of sticks. And the last pig, well, he builds his house out of bricks. And so the story goes, there's this big bad wolf that comes around, probably no relation to the Little Red Riding Hood, or maybe, I'm not really sure, I mean, it's all in the same story, right? And so he comes, and he wants to eat the pigs. And apparently that's a bad thing. But as you know, as Chinese people, we love pigs, so I don't understand what's wrong with it. <laughs> but this is a bad thing, right? So the dialogue goes, he goes from house to house, and he goes to the first house, and he goes, you know, little, little piggy, little piggy, let me come in. And the piggy says, not quite hair, my chin, chin, chin. And then he says, then I'll huff and puff and I'll blow the house down. All right, so he huffs and he puffs and he blows the house down. First one is the house of straws. And depending on how much you want to scar your children in the future, either the pig runs away to his brother's house or he gets eaten up, right? And so you can <laughs> say it however you want, right? You could probably get better morals out of the first part if he gets eaten. Right? Like, if you don't listen to mom and dad, the wolf will eat you. Right? Yeah, I don't know. All right, so anyhow, as he goes, goes to the next house. Let's, let's pretend, let's, let's go with a nicer story, right? So he goes to the house of sticks. And the same thing goes over and over again. And the wolf comes and he blows that house down. And they run off and they go to the house of bricks. And then he goes there, blows, and the bricks don't come down. All right? And then uh, the story ends in one of two ways. Right, the first way is that I guess the wolf kind of gives up and leaves. Second way is he tries to go climb the chimney, because apparently he built the chimney, uh, chimney on this house, goes down the chimney, but, but when he goes down, the pig has this big boiling pot. He falls into the pot, he covers the pot, and then apparently he eats the wolf. It's a really odd story, right? And so it's like, apparently it's not good for the wolf to eat the pigs, but it's okay for the pig to eat the wolf, right? So that's kind of how it goes. So apparently there's a, with these really old, odd stories, there's always these like morals to it, right? So um, so I started looking at like, what's the point of this story? It's such a really odd story. So, so uh, one of them that you can tell your kids, some life lessons, I can say, right? Some life lessons to tell your kids. First one is, uh, do not be lazy or take the short way of building of, of, of your life such as building out of straw or sticks, because you might get eaten up by a wolf, right? So don't be lazy. Um, a second life lesson that we can probably kind of take out of this is that always leave a note. Brick's brother here could have told his other brothers that the department, the, the uh, how, uh, homework department had extra bricks that they can build their house out of bricks, right? But regardless of what goes on, and how the story ends, it always ends with the house of bricks standing up. And no matter what the wolf does, the house of bricks doesn't fall out. It doesn't fall down, right? When he when he huffs and he puffs. And so for us, for what I want for us, what I want us to see this morning is that it matters where you find your refuge in. It matters where you find your refuge in where you find safety, right? It matters where you find your refuge. So in this morning, we're in Isaiah. And we're in Isaiah chapter 14, starting from verse 24. And the big picture, the, the, the picture that Isaiah is trying to paint, and the challenge that Isaiah is trying to give for his readers, and for us this morning, is that God calls us to trust his plans and to find refuge in him. Trust his plans until I find refuge in him. 
So let me go ahead and read from verse 24. It says, The Lord of hosts has sworn, As I have planned, so shall it be. As I have purposed, so shall it stand. That I will break the Assyrian in my land. And on my mountains trample him underfoot, and his yoke shall depart from them, and his burden from their shoulder. This is the purpose that is purposed concerning the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? So if I was to summarize these four verses, it would be this. God has a plan, and he has the power to see it through. He has a plan, and he has the power to see it through, so trust in him. Here's the long version, right? Let's go back to verse 24 through 25. God says that he has a plan, he has a purpose, and it's going to come to fruition. So he goes, come, go and just watch Assyria. So if you were here for a while back, we know that we started talking about Babylon. Like there's, uh, we start switch gears, and God started talking about Babylon through Isaiah, saying that he was going to punish Babylon, that he's going after Babylon. And we, as we learn, Babylon is not just a country, but we know that it is one of the countries. That, that will play a part in, in the story, but is more than just a country, but Babylon stood for a type of attitude, self-sufficiency, arrogance, thinking that you don't need God, right? And this attitude kind of carries on from the very beginning till now, into the future. So, so he's saying that Babylon here not only represents a country, but an attitude. And so he says that in Babylon, he goes, I'm going to exert my justice on Babylon. We talked a little bit about that. And so he's talking about all these things like way into the future. And for, for Judah over here, they're going, well, what happened? Well, about Assyria. They're actually the, the problem that's right in front of us. And so what God does here, he goes, I have this grand plan. A plan for way in the future, a plan in the kind of future. But I'm going to do more than just go, I have this huge plan. Hundreds of years from now, you just need to trust me. God actually says, I want to prove myself to you and show you that I'm trustworthy. And so what he does, he says that I'm going to prove myself that I'm trustworthy, that my future plans are not just good, but I'm powerful enough to see it through. So let me show you what I'm going to do now. So he starts talking about Assyria, the country that is currently tormenting Judah. And so he says, let me show you what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to break the Assyrian in my land, the land that I've given you, Judah. Assyria has become the test subject of if God is really faithful and powerful. Well, we can see what happens in chapters 36 and 37. We can read all about it. God saves them in a miraculous way. Judah didn't even have to fight. God sends an angel and destroys 120,000 soldiers. And we see the king of Syria turn tail and went back. And so Syria is a test subject. It says, what I say about Babylon, when I say about the world, and my example of the word coming true, let me show you my power now. One of the commentators, J. Alec Moyder, says this. He says this, Faith is not credulity, wishful thinking, or a leap in the dark. Rather, it is a leap into the light. For faith is conviction and action based on evidence. Faith is a conviction and action based on evidence. So if I want to put this really simply, it's this. That God has a plan, God has the powers, and he says to trust in him, but he goes, I will give you evidence of who I am to allow you to trust in me. I remember when I first got here, one of the first friends that I met, and I got permission to share this story. One of my first, first friends that I met uh, was Noel. A lot of you know Noel, he was a counselor in the youth group, so I got to work really close with him at that time, him and his wife, Christy. And so I would spend time with him, 
And I remember there was a season of his life uh, where he lost his job and got laid off. And so near that time, we'd go, and we'd go out a lot together. And uh, we'll go have lunch and stuff like that. We'll talk to him. And we'll talk a little bit about this. You know, sometimes it's like, you know, how, how, how are things doing on the, on the job hunt? Are you finding anything? What's going on? Et cetera, et cetera. And I remember he told this story. When I asked him how he was doing. Of course, I think a lot of us, we can either put ourselves in that position. We've been there before. We can only imagine what it's like to lose your job. It's probably a really scary place to be. I remember when he told me, he said that, you know, I'm okay. It's a little scary, but I'm okay. Because I've been through this before. And he talked about story after story of how he lost his job and got provided a new one. And he said that each time it got a little bit easier. This goes. The first time he was very, very scared. I think it was like right before he was going to get married, lost his job. And then happened again, and he saw that God worked once. God took care of him before. So he wasn't as scared. But it was still a little scary, of course, right? It's understandable. But then God provided. And he saw this pattern in his life. It's scary. It's hard. It's hard to trust God when things like that comes, but I've seen him come through before. So it became a little easier to trust him. Because for him, faith was a conviction and action based on evidence. It was a leap into the light, not into the dark. And so for me, this week, when I was studying this passage, I asked myself this question. Well, where's the evidence in my life? I came, with a, I came in with a, a few... Um, a few things with a few truths that, would, that I held on to. I go, if I am really God's child, and if I am really part of his kingdom, he has already revealed how he is trustworthy in my life. So if I can't come up with answers, it's not that there isn't one, it's that I just haven't recognized it. So I was reminded of God's hand bringing me into the Bay Area many years ago for a six-week internship, just six weeks, and I turned my life completely around. In those six weeks, I met a pastor, or I already knew him, but I got to work with a pastor that was very integral in helping me get connected to this church four years later. Uh, during those six weeks, I met a young lady that was very loud, that caught my attention, and I decided that maybe I would marry her. That's the short story. And in those six weeks, it changed my life around from all that happened in all those years prior. In six weeks. Like 26 years of going one direction, six weeks, it got changed around. And then I remembered after when I was about to, I remember, I, I, I remembered again that I remember my fourth year in college, I had to stay, I, I realized at the end of that I had to stay an extra year. And it was very frustrating for me that I had to stay an extra year while I saw all my friends graduate. But that last year altered my life considerably. It altered my life's direction. I got more involved in a church that I was part of only for about a year. I saw how it changed. How I, 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 it changed how I saw God as I continued going to that church. It deepened and readied me for seminary in a way the past four years did it. One year became more impactful than those last four years. And I can keep on going and going. I can keep, I keep on going. I can talk about the time where I thought that where, where, where Dane and I prayed that God would place us in your family when we were looking for a church to serve. And in my heart, I thought I found a place in Mountain View, and I figured that must be it, even though it's not that close. But instead, God had different plans and placed me seven miles away from my in-laws. And so what I want us to think about this morning for ourselves is, where have you seen God at work in your life? Where has God proved himself to you? in his faithfulness 
I want you to stop and think about this. If you are a child of God, he has already proved his faithfulness to you. It's not that he will, but he has already. And of course, he'll continue to. He has not left you alone. See, God doesn't just call us to trust him and have faith in him, but he also calls us to remember what he has done in our lives. He didn't call us just to trust and have faith in him. We, especially when we read in the Old Testament, he calls us to remember. Not just about the future, but remember what I did. And let that, and remember what I did. And let that be a conviction. Let that be hope. And let that be a reminder of what I've done. It is our joy to recall the great things he has done in our lives. How he has been faithful. And so here is my challenge for us this morning. If you can't recall anything in your life, may you be so bold and pray and ask God to reveal the things that He has already done. And for God to prove Himself to you that He is faithful in this season. Because what I know that it is his name at stake, not mine, that I say that you can be bold and ask God, show me your faithfulness again. Show me how you are faithful to me again. If you can't recall anything now, ask God, show me when you have worked. Because you must have worked. Because if you are a child of God, he must have worked. Because he brought you from where you go, I will place my faith in him. He had, he had to work. So ask God, show me. It could have been a marriage that he saved. It could have been seeing family members come to know Jesus. It could have been finding a job when you thought that you couldn't. It could have been various things. But go, show me how you have been faithful to me. And rejoice in it. And be excited about it. This is what we do every Christmas. We're reminded and remember how God was faithful to us by sending his son for us. But also he has done things for you. He's proved himself to be faithful. And so here in this oracle to Syria, God says that it is my purpose, the uh, purpose concerning the whole earth, and he's saying that this is what I'm going to do. I'm telling you right now, so you can see that I am trustworthy, I am faithful, you can see that my plans not only come through, but my plans are the best. But not only does God prove himself faithful, not only he proves himself to be trusted, he also says that we can find refuge in him, in, great, in, in the midst of great difficulties and hardship in our lives. He says that we can find refuge in him, find safety in him. All right, let's, let's keep on reading verse 28. It was in the year that King Ahaz died, came this oracle. Rejoice not, O Philistia, all of you, that the rod has struck you is broken. For from the serpent's root will come forth an adder, and its fruit will be a flying fiery serpent, and the firstborn of the poor will grave. And the needy lie down in safety. But I will kill your root with famine, and your remnant it will slay. Wail, O gate, cry out, O city, melt in fear, O Philistia. All of you, for, for smoke comes out of the north, and there is no straggler in, its ring, in his ranks. What will one answer the messengers of the nation? The Lord has found in Zion, and in the, in the afflicted of his people find refuge. All right, so we see a little shift. Talk about King Ahaz. King Ahaz, not a good king. They didn't trust God. They figured that he could do things on his own. So kind of a real quick kind of backstory, just a reminder of what happened. King Ahaz, uh, Isaiah approached King Ahaz and says, King Ahaz, trust in God. Don't trust in Syria. Don't trust in Israel. Don't trust in Assyria. Don't trust in all the other countries. So at that time, if you remember Judah, was, being, was, was getting a lot of pressure from Syria and Israel because they wanted to form an alliance against Assyria. So what he did, he goes and he trusts Assyria to conquer Syria and to conquer Israel instead of trusting God. And so after Assyria 
takes over Syria and Israel, conquers those, Assyria then turns their eyes towards Judah. And he goes, the people that you trust is not coming against you. And so here we are, King Ahaz, not a great king, didn't trust God. When he passed away, we see this other country comes in play, Philistia. So what happens here, let me give you a little backstory about this country. They are also under the rule of Assyria. But they're like that little feisty little country that just refuse to, uh, you know, submit. So as uh, every opportunity they get, they try to rebel against Assyria. So they try to rebel, they get crushed down, they rise up again, they try to rebel, they get crushed down, they go and they find, they try to find different, like, uh, they try to find different people to kind of go alongside different allies. So they went and, and they got, like, Egypt, like, hey, let's go, let's do this together. Try to rebel, they get crushed again. So here we go, we see King Ahaz die. They send, they send like a group for, you know, to give their condolences. But during that, they're kind of like, hey, you want to form an alliance? Let's try to take down Assyria together now. They're probably feeling really good. Their king just died. Uh, Assyria, was, Assyria was kind of going through their own change. So um, this idea of the rod that struck you is broken. It could mean various things, but the whole point of like, what's going on here is that Philistia thinks that they're in a good position. They think that they can get Judah to form alliance with them and attack Assyria again. And that was their whole goal. And they figure, if Judah doesn't cooperate, no big deal, their, their country's in a little bit of turmoil, so whatever. They thought that they can be the ones that swoop in and offer alliance and offer hope. Might have looked really tempting. But God here says, that, hey, Felicity, you are no match for me. Back off, Judah's mind. And if they're going to find refuge in anything and anyone, it's going to be me, not you. And that's what we see in verse 32. He says, I'm the one that found desire, which is just another name for Judah. He goes, and the people who are afflicted, they will find refuge in me and not you, Felicity. And so we, we see Isaiah write this down mainly for, the, for Judah to read this, to remind them that you find refuge in me. You can find refuge in me. Do not find refuge. Do not try to find your safety in anyone or anything other than me. Especially now that your king, King Ahaz, just passed away. He didn't find refuge in me. He found refuge in Assyria and looked for it without leaving them. And so for this idea here, Isaiah is challenging his readers and all of us to find refuge in the Lord. Because only God can save you. To find refuge in me. But the issue is, for all of us this morning, we try to find refuge and comfort anywhere and everywhere except God. So when I try and manage the daycare in the morning, I usually play some sort of music, right? She likes, so one of the things that happens when, when, when you have a little, when you have a toddler, they, they take over your life, right? They take over your radio station, they take over everything, you can't listen to anything you want anymore. So she'll go and she'll, she'll demand song, a request song, same thing to her, right? So we, we start listening to um, different songs. And so one of the songs that I start playing for her is uh, we sing Bible songs. We sing Bible songs. It's something that I grew up with when I was a kid. I listened to we sing Bible songs, and it was also free on Amazon Prime Music. So you know, it was easy to you know, easy choice to make. And so one of the songs that Maddie would listen to, uh, one of the songs that would come on is the wise man built his house upon the rock. That's a, kind of the song goes. All right. So so the, song, the way the song goes is the wise man built his house upon the rock. And there's another man who's a foolish man who built this house upon the sand. And so it just came on with wise man built this house upon a rock, wise man built this house upon a rock, wise man built this house upon the rock, and the rains came tumbling down. Right? So the rains came down, the floods came up, the rains came down, the floods came up and over and over, and the rock, uh, the house on the rock stood firm. And then talks about another story. The foolish man, he built this house upon the sand. And then what's happened? The rains come down, the floods come up, the rains are gone. Rains come down, the floods comes up, and he goes, and the house on the stand, sand went splat. And he goes, bang, right? And then, without fail, and that's how the song ends. It's just like, that's it. 
without fail. Every single time we listen to the song, she goes, Daddy, why? Why? And I go, okay, well, so I started trying to, like, well, you know, the house on the rock had a strong foundation, the house on the sand crumbled. Why? Every single morning. <laughs> We have the same conversation that I you yesterday. So as she continued to ask, the more theological I got, so I figured if I could just talk my way out of it, she'll just kind of give up, right? <laughs> so that was the foundation, the rocks that for Jesus Christ, where you build your life upon. So when you build your life upon Jesus, when hard times come, your life will stand firm. But for, for other people, they build their lives on a sand, which represents everything else other than Jesus. So it could be money, or it could be this, this, and this. And then when life, hard time comes, your life will fall. And I figured, give all this down, maybe she'll stop talking and just listen to the next song. She says this. She kind of thinks about it. She goes, sand is for playing. <laughs> Because you see, the lot of things that we find refuge in, they aren't always bad things. But not, they are not there to save you. A lot of these things are for your enjoyment, not your deliverance. You see, who you run to for refuge matters. Because when sin, trials, tribulations are blowing at your door, you've got to ask yourself, who did I run to? To for refuge, for salvation. Will it get knocked down like the house of straw or sticks or the house on the sand? Or is your refuge the rock of ages? Jesus. So the question for us this morning is who is your Philistine? Who is the one dangling the hope of comfort and refuge in your lowest of lows? Who is the one that dangles their comfort and hope in the lowest of lows. You see, the big picture here we have is God is calling us to run to Him for refuge against the consequence and devastation of sin, which leads to spiritual death and eternal separation from God. And he goes, run to me for refuge from that. But for some of us this morning, do you run to your good deeds, your good character, or how moral you are? to bring about your right standing before God? Are you leaning upon your own efforts and merit to save you and protect you instead of God as your refuge? But for some of us here, it is the hard times of life that makes it difficult. We might be able to see the big picture thing and go, yes, in the grand scheme of things, I, I run to God for refuge for salvation. But it's about the nitty-gritty every day that we have difficult running to Jesus for, for tr to trust him and find refuge in him. Oftentimes we forget that this applies to all parts of our lives. So for some of us here, the question is, do you run to God's people over God for comfort? Not that there's anything wrong with running to God's people. We're designed for that, to be in community, to find comfort in community. But what I've seen sometimes is that people have, has, people demand God-sized comfort and refuge from God's people. But they will, fit, they will fail because only God can meet those needs. So another way to put it is, do you let your self-worth hide you from the storms of this life? Or for others, maybe it's your success at work or home, or maybe even your success in your hobbies that prop you up so you can feel better about yourself. Essentially, do you let your pride be the refuge from the storm? Or maybe for you, you get lost in hours of brainstorming ways to fix problems, to find a solution, do you let your self-sufficiency and strength be your own refuge? 
Or maybe you're like me. You just want to escape. You shut people out, you get lost in your hobbies, sports, video games, board games, online forums, movies, TV show, music. You just close your eyes and you pretend it's not there. But just because you pretend it's not there doesn't mean you don't need refuge. You see, if you're running to anything or anyone other than God for your refuge, you won't stand firm. It's just like what Maddie was saying. Sand is for playing, implying that it isn't for building your life. It isn't for you to seek refuge in that. All these things that we seek refuge in, oftentimes, is blessings and enjoyment that God has given us, but it's not for foundation purposes. It's not for refuge purposes. God's power and plan is worth trusting our lives with. He is our refuge in this world. And as we continue to move towards Christmas, the celebration of the birth of our Savior, of the birth of our salvation and refuge, let us be reminded that Jesus came to be that refuge for us to be the rock we can build our lives on, to be the strong tower that we can trust our lives with. So this morning, turn towards Jesus to be your refuge. Be reminded that his power and his plan is for our good and his glory. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we continue to go through Isaiah, we are reminded that it's always better to be in your kingdom instead of out of it. That there's great benefits in being a child. That you take care of us, you love us. You give us plans. Your, your plan and your power gives us hope for the future. You are, you are our refuge from this time. So Lord, many of us this morning are looking for refuge, are looking for hope. <coughs> and you show yourself once again to be trustworthy and be the refuge of this man.